I would like to start with a small exercise. Do you know what this is? That's called a tuning fork. That's true. Let me see if you can hear anything. No, you can't. Okay. I, w I, I wanna ask you something. If I hear a sound here, and then I move and hit it and listen to that sound here, do you think it changes? How about if I move over here? No? Are you sure? How about if I move, I move here? You think it's the same sound? Okay. Keep that in mind, please. You know, Daniel is a special guy. And on the first Sabbath of 2022, a conventional year of 2022, I think he's like the sound of the tuning fork. Does that make sense? You know, my name is Joseph. In the church of my childhood, seven out of the 70 members of the church were Joseph. And I, feel, I, I felt good about it. I thought, hey, that's special. You know, in the end, Joseph is a superhero of the Bible, right? Then I went to college. And in college, seven, seven out of my 30 colleagues were called, what do you think? Not Joseph. Daniel. And there was one single Joseph. And I thought, hey, that's weird. So I realized Daniel was probably even uh, more prominent in the Bible for some people than Joseph was. He really is a special guy. Do you have a favorite episode of his life? How many of you like the story Daniel in the Fiery Furnace? Daniel in the Fiery Furnace? Okay. There's no story with Daniel in the Fiery Furnace. Okay? Is, is Daniel somewhere else? Where? Yes, it's Daniel in the lion's den. True. You know, a few years ago, I had the chance to visit the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Have you ever been there? You know, Washington, D.C. has many, many museums that you can visit for free. So if you're in the area, don't go, go to uh, parks, go to museums. You can find parks somewhere else. But I had a chance to visit that place, and in that uh, gallery of art, there is a famous painting of a Flemish painter called Rubens. The name of the painting is Daniel in the, fire, in the lion's den. It's very interesting how Daniel is represented in that famous painting. He's sitting like this. And the moment is in the morning when King Darius comes to the, the entrance of the den to see if he's still alive. So he's sitting like this, rather relaxed, surrounded by lions that squint and yawn at the light of the dawn. This guy, Daniel, a young fellow, long curly hair, and uh, huge muscles, pretty good looking. What do you think about it? Do you know how old Daniel was when he got into the lion's den? He was 
way over 80. Mm -hmm. we, know, we know from um, the story of his beginnings in chapter 1, we know he was a very good-looking guy, a handsome guy. He's still good-looking. Somebody can be good-looking at 80 plus 2. Hey, right? Handsome guy, but still 80 plus. You know, if you read Daniel chapter 6, you will tell me that Daniel chapter 6 is about Daniel in the lion's den. I will tell you, no, it's not about Daniel's in the lion's den. It's about Daniel outside the lion's den. Please be aware of the fact that Daniel was born outside of the lion's den. He grew up outside the lion's den. He even grew famous outside the lion's den. Not only that, he grew old. You know where? Outside the lion's den. But one day he got into the lion's den. If you are like Daniel, if you are faithful, just like Daniel, one way you are going to get close to the lion's den. So much so that one day you may land in the lion's, in the lion's den. I want to say something, and please keep this in mind. The way you behave outside the lion's den tells me a whole lot, a great deal about how you will behave in the lion's den. It's interesting in the story of Daniel that by the time he got in the lion's den, he had been through many, many things. He's been tested many, many times. We only knew about a few tests from the Bible. The first test is in chapter 1 when the test was be like us. Just be like us. Then in chapter 3, in the episode of the fiery furnace, the test is not Daniel's really, it's his companions. And the test is worship our gods. You can worship your God, but worship our gods as well. And then finally, here in chapter 6, the test is don't worship your God. So by this time, you would say Daniel got used to it. By this time, Daniel should be relaxed. Hey, relax. It's nothing but a test. You've seen how many times God intervened for you throughout your 80 plus years. And indeed, if you look at his life, God allowed his faith, his faithfulness to be tested. And again and again, God brought him out, gave him victory. What is weird in this episode in chapter 6 is that on his way to the lion's den, even the king, King Darius, who was both a good friend and the king that threw him in the lion's den, the king tells him, relax. It's nothing but a test. Look at what he says in Daniel chapter 6, verse 16. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, your God whom you serve, how? Continually. He will deliver you. And then after the test of his faith. This is what it says in verse 20. Daniel, servant of the living God, the king says, has your God whom you serve, how? Same word, continually. Has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Let us pray. Lord, as we look into Daniel's life, we pray that your spirit will work in us as well. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Darius becomes king and he wants to reorganize his kingdom. In the middle of this reorganizing effort, efforts, we can see this story about Daniel in the lion's den. Look at the structure of the chapter first. It starts with Daniel's prosperity. It ends with Daniel's prosperity. There's a decree against worshiping Daniel's God. Then there is a decree on the other side for worshiping Daniel's God. On one side, Daniel is sentenced. On the other side, Daniel is released. Can you please notice for me what is up there at the peak of the chiastic structure? What is there? It's Daniel's deliverance. So Darius is reorganizing his kingdom. He sets 120 satraps over his kingdom. And over the 120 satraps, he puts three governors. But then as he analyzes the life and activity of the three governors, he notices something. Verse 3 says, verse 3 then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit, in Aramaic, a ruach yatir, which means an excellent, an extraordinary, an extreme, an exceeding or a surpassing spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. Please try to imagine this Ruach Yatir that was in Daniel. An excellent spirit, an excellent and extraordinary, extreme, exceeding or surpassing spirit. Can you see a surpassing spirit? A spirit surpassing Daniel? Remember, in his youth, Daniel is a handsome guy. He's a teenager when he's taken to Babylon, probably in his years of growth still. But he's a spirit-filled young man. And if the spirit fills Daniel, then you would expect that the spirit is at least as big as Daniel, right? Now, in the meanwhile, Daniel keeps on growing to his full stature, and the Spirit keeps growing with him. At one point, I don't know how it is with you, but at one point I started, I stopped growing. Not only that, something very weird starts happening. You know, my dad, my father passed away at 73, it was two years ago, but for most of my life, my dad was taller than me. Then after a while I noticed my dad's height and mine was pretty much the same. The year before he passed away, I checked it out and I couldn't believe how much shorter he was than me. Something had happened. My dad was shrinking. So please imagine Daniel at 80 plus and compare his stature to what he used to be at 18, say. Is there a difference? Still good looking, right? But he's shrinking. But throughout his life, he was a spirit-filled man. Do you think when Daniel started shrinking, the spirit started shrinking too? Suppose this is the spirit in Daniel, and I am Daniel. And Daniel is shrinking now. Can you see the exceeding or the surpassing Spirit, 
You understand what I'm talking about? So, so uh, here you have this elderly guy who's already shrinking in his stature, but the spirit that is within him is not shrinking. And when the king looks at Daniel, in Daniel he notices a Ruach Yatir. You may know this story about the little girl that uh, was attending church with grandma, and now on their way home, she turns to grandma and says, Grandma, I heard the pastor said God was so big that he fills the whole universe. Is that true? And grandma says, yeah, sweetheart, that's true. Oh, I see. But you know, grandma, the preacher also said God is so big and yet he lives in our hearts. Is that true, grandma? And now grandma is like, yeah, that is true. Hmm. After a time of silence, she turns to grandma and she says, Grandma, then shouldn't parts of God be coming out of us? See, Daniel? He had parts of God coming out of him. And the king looked at Daniel. He said, hey, I, I can see I can see a Ruach Yadir in him. I can see that surpassing spirit, a, a spirit that surpasses him. He is this big, but the spirit is bigger than him. An excellent, a surpassing spirit is in him. Daniel has an excellent surpassing spirit, or rather, an excellent, a surpassing spirit has Daniel. I think there's a difference there, right? To have an excellent spirit or the excellent, excellent spirit to have you. And Darius is not the only one to notice this. Remember in chapter 5 when uh, in a night, during the night, uh, a party of drinking, of debauchery, the queen... The mother queen, Belshazzar's queen, uh, key, uh, mother, comes to him and says, Hey, there is a man in your kingdom that has a Ruach Yatir. Daniel was known for that. That's what made Daniel famous. Remember, by this time, Daniel has served under Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, and the Babylonian kingdom was overcome by the Medes and Persians. So it's a totally different government now, and Daniel is still holding on. He's still there, staying strong in office. He's a public figure, a strong personality, and what is known about him throughout the kingdom is that in him there is a Ruach Yatir. So the king noticed him. This is a lesson of life, brothers and sisters. When your enemies notice you've been noticed, they will immediately turn on the search machinery. Have you ever seen the search machinery scrutinizing you? When they go and turn every stone, open every box, they can even remove a few layers of stucco to go and see everything in your past. And that's what happens to Daniel. Chapter 6, verse 4, this is what it says. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find no charge or fault because he was, he was, he was faithful. 
nor was there any error or fault found in him, the NAS says, any negligence or corruption. The word shalu in Aramaic is error or negligence. It's a technical word that has to do, technical word that has to do with work, work, somebody's professional life, somebody's proficiency. So that's the, th the first thing they scrutinize. They want to find something against Daniel in his professional profile, in his proficiency. Can they find anything? Well, it's not easy, not, not difficult to find something wrong in somebody's workmanship. You know, even excellent professionals, proficient people, can make terrible mistakes. I'm impressed to see how doctors hang in there and do their best in the hospital throughout this pandemic. It's amazing, and I, I, I think they deserve our appreciation and love. Can we give a, a big hand to our medical field people? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for putting your life on the line for us. But you know, I've also heard and read about stories in which there were accusations of negligence in this area. I even heard about children burned in incubators because of negligence of some nurses or people that handle those machines. I heard about explosions that happened because of the negligence of people that handle machines under pressure or power. I've heard about bridges that collapsed because of the negligence of some architects or constructors. Negligence is very human. And you may think about Daniel, how, how could this Daniel has, have such a perfect workmanship? It's amazing, it's unbelievable. I know he is a type of Jesus, although historically he is before Jesus in Bethlehem. I know Jesus was a professional, he was a pro for, for real. Do you know what his trade was? Carpenter. In Mark chapter 6, verse 3, they call him the carpenter, the carpenter, not a carpenter. I pretty much can see that Jesus' workmanship was perfect. But how about Daniel's? Was he that perfect? That all the search machinery of those enemies could not find anything against him? This is what I believe. When somebody has a Ruach Yatir, or when somebody is possessed by a Ruach Yatir, that Ruach Yatir is able to even blind the search machinery, that they will not be able to find anything. And here we are, looking at Daniel, they are scrutinizing him, and they cannot find anything against him. Please keep this in mind. If God placed you as a professional, as a proficient servant of His kingdom, in a certain place to represent Him there, the enemy is not happy about that. And the enemy will do all he can, will go out of his way to remove you from there. But here's the thing. If you are faithful, that's what Dan Daniel was. Daniel was faithful. Faithful to whom, you may ask? Well, faithful to God. But in that context, it seems that he was faithful in his work. Is that two kind of faithfulness? No, it's the same kind of faithfulness. Somebody that is faithful to God is faithful in his context of professional work as well. And if you are a professional... Faithful, faithful to God, 
faithful in everything you do. And God wants you to stay there where He placed you to be at the center of influence. I can say this, no matter how many people will scrutinize you, no matter how strong the search machinery is, no matter how strong the desire to remove you, relax. It's nothing but a test. Because the excellent spirit is there protecting you. If the excellent spirit has something better for you, you will move on. But you will move up, not move down. You will move to a place where God can use you even better. That's the first aspect, proficiency. The second aspect is probity. Do you know what probity means? I know it's a tricky word. It means integrity. It comes from probe, probity. Integrity, that's what it means. The text says... They couldn't find any fault, any error, shalu, or fault, shahat. And shahat in Aramaic means corruption. If the enemy couldn't find anything in his professional profile against him, then the enemy is now trying to prove him corrupt. And that's very ironic. Hilarious, I would say, some corrupt politicians are scrutinizing Daniel the politician to see if he's corrupt or not. But let's assume it. You know, most of the time when we say corruption or we hear about corruption, we think about politicians. They are the corrupt. But let's admit that in every field, there are excellent professionals that are corrupt. Competent, but corrupt. Yes, a competent politician, but corrupt. A competent businessman, but corrupt. A competent constructor, but corrupt. A competent IT manager, but corrupt. A competent pastor, that sounds weird, yeah, but corrupt. In every area of work, in every field. And they search and they search, they, they scrutinize Daniel's life, they can't find anything. I wonder how that can be. I know he's a type of Jesus Christ in this as well. You know, Pilate said about Jesus Christ, I can't find any fault, any guilt in him. But how can somebody get to that point where no corruption can be found in him or her? I would like to read a very well-known passage from Alan G. White, the book of the book Education. And uh, I'm going to write it I mean, read it first to the point where we usually hear it quoted, up to that point. But then I will read on because there's something interesting there. The greatest want of the world is the want of, you know this, right? Everybody quotes, even corrupt people quote this. The greatest want of the world is the want of men and women. When, when Ellen White says men, that's human, right? That's the, the idea. Human who will not be bought or sold. Human who in their inmost souls are true and honest. What else? Human who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men, men and women whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men and women who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. And usually people stop here quoting. But let's just read on a little bit. But 
Such a character is not the result of accident. So it's not accident. It's not due to the special favor, to special favors, no special favors, or endowment of providence, giftedness. God gifted that person with that. No, no. How is it acquired then? A noble character is the result of what? Say it aloud, please. Self-discipline. Ah, oh, this guy, Daniel. Self-discipline of the subjection of the lower to the higher nature, the surrender of self to the service of love to God and man. Yes, it's self-discipline, subjection, surrendering to love for the service of God and man. And that is Daniel. And that is to be faithful, faithful to God and faithful in everything you do. When you see Daniel's life and you see that he is in submission, he's surrendered to God, then you understand how is it that they did not find anything really against him. No corruption was found in this guy. No corruption at all. You know, if you're a good professional, because usually that's where the search machinery starts with the professional profile. If, if they don't find anything there, then they will move to your probity, to your character, to your integrity. And uh, if you are corrupt, you're in big trouble. But if you are surrendered to God, if you are in the service of love to God and man, relax. It's nothing but a test. You know why? Because the Ruach Yatir within you will protect you. Proficiency, probity, and now comes piety. Piety? Piety, you know, back in the day when they spoke about the Ten Commandments, they said the first four was about piety, God, relationship to God, and the last six were probity, relationship with other people. So now it's about piety. They search his professional profile, no mistake, no error, no negligence. They searched his probity, his character, his integrity. They couldn't find any corruption in him, no fault. So they go one step further, verse 5. Verse 5. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concealing, co concerning what? The law of his God. So now their problem is not with God's Daniel. Their problem is with Daniel's God. It's piety, not probity. And what happens there? You know, the Bible says that God's children is the apple of his eye. And they search and search. They can't find anything. Now they go against God himself. And what happens? A decree is given. The king is pressured. Nobody is allowed to pray for how many days? How many days? You'll have to check this out. Okay? That's homework. They are not allowed to pray. And then your question is, okay, so what is Daniel going to do? Verse 10. This is what he's doing. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. Again, he just goes home. And in his upper room, with his window open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day. 
and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. Hmm? Interesting. Daniel, listen, brother. Do you really need to do that? I mean, couldn't you just at least close the window? I mean, do you, do you really have to expose yourself? Here is the point. If you're Daniel, faithful, and you are known to be faithful, and you are known to have as part of your custom, as part of your daily routine, the three-time prayer with your windows open toward Jerusalem, can you hide and still be faithful? When everybody knows the decree is given so that you cannot pray to your God. And you have been known to be faithful. You have been famous in the kingdom that you have a Ruach Yatir within you. You know and everybody knows that your routine of prayer takes you three times to your knees and your windows are open toward Jerusalem. Can you hide and still faith be faithful? See? If you're Daniel, known for faithfulness, known for prayer, you cannot hide. You will go on doing what you're used to do. Because you know everybody is watching you. What kind of character is this Daniel? And then the story goes on. They eventually catch him. It's inevitable because the search machinery is all over the place. They catch him. He's taken to the lion's den. Ironically, on the way there, the king shouts to him, Hey, relax! It's nothing but a test. The God you have served continually will be able to save you. But then, next day, in the morning, early in the morning, the troubled king comes to see him. And it's interesting to read through the description of, of the king, verse 18. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. It's like the king is fasting for Daniel. That's very interesting. And no musician, no entertainment were brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Verse 19, then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions, and verse 20, the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? What is the answer? Was he able to deliver him? Verse 22, watch this. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths so that they have not hurt me, because I was found, what? Innocent before him. You know the name Daniel means Daniel. God is my judge. So it's like Daniel saying, hey, God judged me. And in his sight, I was found innocent. Now that's faithfulness. I would like to ask you, what if he had not gone on with his daily routine of prayer? Would we still read this as a testimony from him? That he was found innocent before God? And also, O King, I have done no wrong before you. Watch the reaction of the king. I make a decree. These are kings. These are political leaders. They make decrees about everything. 
I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, man must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. His view is a, still a little bit skewed, of course. But this is what he says, for he is the living God. The king of Medo-Persia recognizes the God of Daniel as being the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall endure to the end. And verse 27 says, he delivers and rescues and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth who has delivered Daniel from the power of the Lions. Relax, it's nothing but a test. See? When I say the word test in this context here, I'm not referring, I'm not referring to, to being tested in the sense of, are you making to heaven or not? That's not my point here. And throughout the book of Daniel, that's not the point. The point is that the test of faithfulness, the test of, of representing God in His beauty, in His love, in a way that can be marked by the King Himself, who notices the Ruach Yatir within you, He, the King Himself, said, the God you have been serving, how? Continually. Now, oh, that's amazing. That's what I'm talking about. And when somebody is like that, then indeed, relax, it's nothing but a test. There's a, an interesting devotional kind of book written by Max Lucado, Grace for the Moment. And in that book, he tells the story of uh, two people that live in the same building, a music teacher that lives on the ground floor, and a student that lives upstairs. And every morning the student comes down, downstairs, cracks the door of the old uh, music teacher, sticks his head in and says, uh, good morning, sir, what's the good news? And like in a very meaningful ritual, the old man takes his tun tuning fork, hits the handle of his wheelchair, gives it to the young man, and he says, hey, the good news is this is middle C. This is middle C. It was a middle C yesterday. It will be a middle C tomorrow. It's going to be a middle C a thousand years for now, from now. This is middle C, and it never changes. So this is the message for you for 2022. Proficiency, probity, piety. Actually, the other way around. Piety, probity, proficiency. The most important thing, your relationship with God. The second most important, your relationship with everybody else. Third very important thing, your professional profile. This third thing is not to neglect, because the search machinery usually starts this way and gets to your piety, your relationship with God. You are Daniel, or Danielle, or Daniela, or Dan, or Dane, or Don. You are the middle C. Or let me ask, are you a middle C? Because to be correct, to be fair, it wasn't Daniel. That was the middle C. It was the Ruach Yatir in Daniel. That was the middle C. But when somebody has a Ruach Yatir within him or her, that person becomes middle C. 
And that's, that's the promise and that's the perspective that God gives you for 2022. You know, we live in very dangerous and slippery times. And uh, the closer we get to the end of this sinful history of earth, the closer we get to the lion's den. I don't know how to, how to express this better, but this is the, the mental picture I have. If you look down the road carefully, you will be able to notice some lions. If, if you start listening carefully, you will be able to, to hear some lions roaring. That's the age we live in. We are currently living in that age. So the question is, in your heart, what is going on when, when you see the lions, when you hear the lions roar? What is happening in your heart? And the message coming from God through the story of Daniel is, relax. It's nothing but a test. Because if you are faithful, and how are you faithful unless you are in communication with the one you're faithful to? How are you faithful unless you are a man or woman of prayer? How are you faithful unless you are known around you, in your work setting, in your family, in your neighborhood? You are known to be faithful because people can notice in your frail, fragile stature the presence of a Ruach Yatir, an excellent, surpassing spirit. You know, because if you are faithful, if you are a man or woman of prayer, and let me, let me clarify this, being a man or woman of prayer doesn't mean you are faithful. There are people that pray pray a lot, and they either pray to the wrong person, to the wrong God, or pray like just telling poems. No, prayer, real prayer, is something that is connected to real life. That's what faithfulness is about. If you're faithful, if by the Spirit living in you, by Jesus Christ living in you, you are a middle sea. It doesn't matter how many people plotted against you. It doesn't matter how many lions in the lion's den. It doesn't matter if your best friend, Darius, betrayed you. As the song says, no matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through all the day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. Amen.